everybody. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to our uh, second class of the uh, Joy of Learning uh, Forgotten Histories course on Portuguese and Cape Verdean communities of Falmouth and Cape Cod. Um, I'd like to welcome everyone wherever you're dialing in from, most of you probably from Falmouth. Um, I'm coming in from uh, outside of Lisbon, Portugal, and uh, excited to be with you again this week uh, for another, another round. Um, today, Lou and I are going to talk about, uh, pick up kind of where we left off uh, with that early period of the whaling and talk about uh, Falmouth's farming community and some industrial agricultural um, uh, history as well of, uh, of the region. Let me share my screen with you all. where it should be. Oh, that's not what I wanted to share, but well, we'll do it this way. You as actual size and perfect. All right. So is this here? All right, everybody can see that all right, the page well enough. Nothing's getting cut off, I hope. Yes, it's good. Okay, good. So, um, yeah. So um, I wanna talk a little bit today about um, farmers, laborers and unwanted immigrants. Um, one of the things that I like to do when I talk about immigration in the past is try and point out that some of the problems that we're facing or confronting with immigration today are, th are things that have been going on for a long time. And one of the unfortunate, I think, um, repeated stories that happened not only in the last hundred, but really in the last 200 years uh, is the way that groups of immigrants that come into the US confront problems, in some ways are able to overcome some of those problems and then treat the next group of immigrants as badly as they were treated themselves. Um, and this has happened with almost every immigrant group that's come into the U.S. Um, you know, Euro European immigrant groups. I'm talking about, uh, you're talking about uh, groups of people from other places. It's been a more difficult, I think, an ongoing problem for some reasons that we're actually going to talk about a little bit about today. Um, so next. I want to give you a little bit of historical context here. So. Most of the migration to, uh, of the Portuguese to the United States, and Lou has some great, uh, if you remember from last week, Lou has some great slides on this. Uh, I'm sure that you, uh, you, you'll you show those, Lou, when you start, when you start talking. But um, as we talked about, a very, only a very small percentage of migrants from uh, Portugal and Portuguese territories came to the U.S., uh, during this whaling period, this 1830 uh, to 1870 period. Um, you know, something, you know, it's prob probably a conservative estimate is, is around 2% or 2 or 3%. I, I actually tend to think it's quite a bit lower um, if, I had to, if I had to make a bet. Uh, but in terms of the statistics and all that, we're, we're pretty conservative in guessing around 3% or so. Uh, the rest came, you know, of, 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 the, of the batch that came up until about 1930. So most of them, most of the immigrants came uh, because they came to work in industrial, uh, industrial manufacturing for the most part. Now, if you remember that slide we had last week where we looked at uh, all of the, uh, the number of ships and in uh, whaling, whaling ships and whaling voyages and, and saw how it matched up pretty neatly with the largest populations of uh, immigrants coming from Portugal and Portuguese territories. New Bedford, places like New Bedford, places like uh, places like um, uh, Falmouth, also in there, Provincetown, Nantucket. These were all places that that were included in that uh, on that list. New London was another place uh, that had quite a bit of immigration from uh, from whaling. Your sensors are not responding. Please see the yeah, I'm not sure who. Some, Lou, I don't know if that's you, but uh, I think or Sue, maybe. There's a uh, there's a there's a we keep getting messages in. I don't know if uh, that's, someone's not that's, muted. I will mute. Okay. All right. Uh, so, yeah, I don't um, think anyone else is. Thanks. Uh, okay. All right. So, um, so, so uh, these populations uh, sort of match up with with these places where whaling came in. But but really, the story behind that is the way that 
these uh, groups of people that were that were there and the roots that were established between places in the Azores and uh, Cabo Verde and New England um, began to recruit industrial mill workers and industrial factory workers as um, as this ramps up um, in, around 1870 and around the 1870s. Um, you had a couple of sets of situations. One was a lot of Irish immigrants had been, and women actually, had been working in, uh, in mills. Um, if, you, if you look at the situation in Lowell, for example, a lot of the mill, uh, the, the, the women working in mills uh, were effectively, they were farmers' daughters that went to the big city, lured by the opportunity at uh, educational, at better, bettering themselves in some ways. At least this is how it was sold to them by the mill owners in Lowell. Um, who acted as a sort of in loco parentis with, uh, with these women once they went there and became responsible for their religious education and other parts of their upbringing. The reality though, um, is that they were confronted with really gruesome work conditions. And um, similarly, the Irish uh, uh, went through a, a similar process as well. Now we have to do something here and that's distinguish between two different kinds of, uh, of mill workers. We have to distinguish between mill workers that worked in what are called um, uh, traditionally are called unskilled labor positions, what I prefer to, to refer to as uh, low wage, uh, low wage earning uh, jobs, which are really the most difficult, the hardest jobs, the most dangerous jobs. I mean, you can't understand life in a factory. Um, you're constantly breathing in this, this, cl in this cloud of dust fiber from the cotton fibers that you're constantly ingesting. Respiratory problems were, were a nightmare for, uh, for these people. Um, in addition, I don't know if anyone's ever been to a working mill before, but if you go to uh, the boot cotton mills up in Lowell, which I would encourage everybody here to do, it's an incredible place. It's one of my uh, one of the one of the most great one of the greatest live museums, and it's only about an hour drive away from you all. Um, you know, if you're down on the Cape, um, it's it's a, a phenomenal place. But they have about eight of of these machines still working, where they show you how uh, uh, the, you know these weaving machines. And just the din from eight of these machines is enough to you know, put a ringing in your ears for an hour after you leave the space. There were 80 of these machines running at a time now, not just eight. So imagine uh, you know, what that would be like if you were, uh, you know, if you were trying to live in this, uh, in these kind of, or work in these kinds of uh, situations. Uh, where's OSHA when you need it? So um, another problem that took place in the mills was that, um, uh, was that people, they, they, it wasn't very stable work. No one got a job in the mill, especially if you were in one of these low wage positions uh, that, um, you know, where you were employed all year round. You were constantly getting laid off uh, at different times of the year. Uh, a lot of times, one of the strategies of the mill owners was actually to encourage strikes or at least not to settle strikes uh, or encourage particularly bad conditions to get people to quit. Uh, and then they would build up a surplus of cotton um, or rather of, um, of textiles, uh, which would then could then be parceled out over the rest of the year without having to pay wages. Um, so th there were a number of problems that were confronted by, um, by, these, um, by these workers, not the least of which, um, oh, I had a slide here that I guess got, I missed, but not the least of which was um, the fact that low wage workers and most of these migrants that were low wage workers were coming from Southern Europe and the Middle East. So Italy, uh, but this also included um, uh, Central Europe as well with a lot of Polish. So um, in Fall River, you also have a group of French Canadian mill workers as well, uh, as well as in Lowell and other places. Uh, but what starts to happen is um, these groups start to organize as, uh, as you know, they, they organize labor unions. And as one group begins to organize labor unions and fight for better wages and begins to strike, the mill owners decide just not to hire that group anymore. And they hire another group, that, other groups that would be more pliable, um, that they could be more easily exploitable. So they ended up hiring um, uh, people that were coming from Portugal. Now, all of these places where the, uh, where the whaling industry was booming, a lot of the spaces got uh, transformed into, or a lot of the capital rather, got transformed into money for mills. Um, and in fact, in some cases, the ships themselves were, uh, were transformed into barges and these kinds of things and other ships that could transport uh, textiles. But, uh, but really it's about the capital that got, that got transformed. 
uh, into uh, into the next big money making enterprises, which were uh, these mills. So the Scottish and the English were founded their own unions. Now you have to remember in Europe, the heart of the, the whole union unionization movement and syndicalist movement really starts in Europe. And many of the workers, at least coming from places like continental Portugal, um, actually had, uh, and there were many people recruited from the north of Portugal where there were tremendous uh, textile factories and where they had experienced workers, skilled workers um, uh, that, had, that knew their way around these machines. And um, uh, many of these people brought with them, not only their skills in working in textiles, but also their sensibilities in uh, working uh, in unions. So um, uh, they, were, they were quick to organize many of them. Uh, however, the unionization movement in the US was actually quite segregated. So you had Irish, or you, you had Scottish and English uh, uh, laborers working in you know, these so-called skilled positions who refused to allow uh, other kinds of immigrants to join their unions. Um, and no one would help what would, what was, was really interested. They, these, uh, you know, the AFL, for example, did not, you know, was one of the, uh, quite, a, quite an, an organization that was quite against immigration, was very much against um, um, allowing these immigrants to join the union, and also was, was one of the more prominently um, uh, racists uh, in, in, their, in terms of their rhetoric against the immigrants in the US. Uh, that transforms over time, obviously, but during this time period, um, yeah. this, was, this was the case. Um, the people that really were interested in organizing these unions were the co communists and socialists. Uh, they were the only ones that were interested in, in organizing uh, a lot of the immigrant workers. And interestingly, uh, most of the immigrant workers were not necessarily, um, uh, you know, they, they hadn't come, although uh, some, some from Europe did have a tradition of, of leftist uh, labor organization, but most of those coming from the Azores and Cabo Verde were farmers. They had no experience whatsoever working in the mills. Um, there were people who had farms um, and were recruited uh, into these big urban centers uh, where whaling had existed uh, to come work as, uh, as laborers. And then uh, also came as a result of chain migration where family members were there, would send back home and say, look, I can get you a job in this place or they're looking for, for people to work. You can live with me for a while. Until, uh, until you find a place. So this was another way that many of them you know, came over and found work in these factories. If you look at the story of Falmouth, Falmouth was less of a place that, um, that um, uh, had co was contracting workers to come there directly. Uh, it happens in a couple of cases. In fact, um, in uh, the early 1900s, the first decade of the 1900s, there's a group of Cape Verdean uh, workers that get contracted to come work as seasonal workers on cranberry box. Uh, however, there was a big bait and switch that took place. Um, uh, this is actually, I'm sorry, not in the first decade, it was in the second decade of the 1900s in the teens. And um, you know, they come not to work as um, uh, factory workers, but they come to work as, in, uh, in, in cranberry box. And the wages in the cranberry box um, uh, actually, I'm sorry, that's, um, I, I, I mistold the story. That's, it's the other way around. They, they, they came to work in a munitions factory in, um, uh, in, um, um, in, in, in New Bedford. And when they, get to, to, uh, when they get to the docks, they're told they're not going to be working as uh, in the munitions factory because they were told they were all illiterate. Uh, and, um, and so they, instead they would be sent down to the bogs, the cranberry bogs to work in uh, you know, cranberry box. So um, this bait and switch worked where, you know, they were, they brought some of these workers to, um, you know, to the Cape um, uh, by way of, uh, you know, playing these kind of tricks on them. Um, but this one particular group of Cape Verdeans actually refused to get off the docks in Boston uh, unless they were prom given the promised wages that they, that they said that they were going to be able to earn. Um, and, um, you know, and, and in addition, they were told that after their short time on the, on the working in the cranberry box, they were going to be forced to go back to Cape, to Cape Verde, um, which this, you know, they also refused because this was not in the terms of their contract. So um, most of the people that are getting recruited are getting recruited to come into these industrial uh, areas. There's a secondary migration that takes place, however, to Falmouth. And the secondary migration is very much about um, workers that are getting contracted uh, or that are losing their contracts or who are getting laid off or who realize that the conditions 
uh, in these factories compared to what they had been doing back in their homes and on farms are just horrendous and they would rather try their luck elsewhere. So many of them go back, go, go, um, start to find work on cranberry bogs and in other farms in Falmouth. Um, for most of you, um, I don't know if this is new to many of you, but for those of you who have studied or all or read or all or from Falmouth, um, we all know the story in Falmouth, um, which is that the Port these Portuguese workers then started buying cheap parcels of land in the quote unquote eastern part of town, uh, which was uh, largely abandoned farmland. The land was very cheap. Um, and rather than working in the cranberry bogs, those of them, those who could amass capital, uh, were able to uh, purchase land uh, either working by, uh, by saving money with family members um, or, or you know, they, they just had a mass capital themselves and were able to start their own farms. Um, we should be clear and say this is an incredible story and it happened to many, many, many families in Falmouth, but it didn't happen to all the families in Falmouth. Um, there are still families that were working as wage earners um, in the Cranberry Bogs that were still working as wage earners for other Portuguese who, were, who owned their own farms. Um, and oftentimes, uh, one of the big pushes that brought a lot of the, the Portuguese to Falmouth was recruiting drives by uh, Portuguese farmers. And again, when I say Portuguese during this time period, I mean people from the Azores predominantly at Cabo Verde, um, Cabo Verde becoming an independent country in the 70s. Um, but uh, at this point, these are, you know, they're all uh, Portuguese passports holders or citizens. They're all Portuguese citizens in any case. And um, these Portuguese citizen farmers are recruiting from places like New Bedford and Fall River, mostly from New Bedford, however, uh, to bring uh, people to the, to the Cape to work either seasonally, work for a little while and then go back. Many of those people end up staying. Some of them, um, like the Rubisas, um, Philip Rubisa, for example, sells some of his land to some of these work to some of the workers, um, as well as the marshals, uh, who had uh, a number of, um, of, of cranberry uh, fields, or uh, cranberry, I'm sorry, uh, strawberry fields, uh, along Sandwich Road, the beginning of Sandwich Road, uh, as it comes off of uh, Route 28, um, and uh, and start to sell uh, parcels of land to other people and to other, um, you know, to many of the people that were actually recruited. Many of them Cape Verdeans who were recruited to work for them uh, on the uh, on the strawberry fields seasonally. So. What kind of reception did these individuals get? Uh, Lou is going to talk in a little bit about uh, Lou and actually Karen as well is going to uh, Karen Hines who uh, who's um, in the in the course and who's also um, uh, was one of the mainstays in our history group uh, is also going to talk to us a little bit today as well, but um, uh, about some found of families. But I'd like to just give you a little bit of context about the reception that, that these immigrants were and, and the world that these immigrants were, were confronting and they were facing. So low wage workers, and this, this is part of why the low wage workers were rejected by the craft unions. On the one hand, it was a purely practical uh, uh, consideration in that they felt that because they had skilled positions, they would better be able to negotiate for a larger share of, uh, of the factory owner's uh, money uh, if they were able to, or their money actually, because they were the ones doing the manufacturing, but a, a larger share of the profits that were being made off of the, off the goods they were producing. Um, if they didn't have uh, the, the large swap and mass of workers involved in their, um, in their uh, project of, of unionization. So that was one reason. But on top of this is a lot of these, uh, um, these issues were, um, what were also about a legacy that came from slavery. So when we talk about racism, we're really talking, we're not, we're not just talking about black and white, what we're really talking about are arguments about ideologies of difference. We're talking about an ideology that um, determines that certain groups of people, uh, and those groups of people are then classified by various uh, characteristics, usually physical, uh, although not always, um, uh, that uh, that then presumably determine that they're inferior at certain kinds of uh, you know they're, they're, they're unsuited for certain kinds of um, of of, uh, of work. Um, the way that it plays out in the U.S. was it was mostly about citizenship. The arguments were that because people were culturally, intellectually, physically, mentally inferior, that they shouldn't be allowed to become citizens or full participants in the United States. Um, and uh, this is something that actually goes back several hundred years 
Uh, I'm doing some research right now on um, the beginning of, uh, of the uh, Atlantic slave trade, uh, looking at old um, uh, captain's accounts from the 1500s. And one thing that I'm coming across is that is the way that, that this idea of low level workers that were necessary to actually carry out the process of empire, uh, these low level workers need to be treated very badly. They need to be basically exploited. And how is it justified that these low level workers are exploitable? Well, they're considered to be morally, intellectually, physically inferior. And this kind of talk gets embedded into how, um, how these groups of workers get uh, treated over the past you know, 500 years. And by the way, this also includes indentured servants um, who, who also are subjected to some of this kinds of language as well. So, um, but this really takes, the, the sort of modern understanding of race and immigration is really about the ethnologist movement in the US um, that, that takes place as a way to try and justify slavery during the abolitionist movement. And again, um, this, this book, this, um, you know, this book uh, by Eliot uh, is essentially just an apology for, you know, for why slavery um, uh, was, was um, you know, was a good idea in the minds of these, of these really twisted, uh, twisted thinkers. Um, and um, our own Herman Melville actually writes a brilliant essay um, that takes on directly the Portuguese and how the Portuguese fit into these racial classifications. So um, some people look at this Mel Melville's essay that know about it, it's called The Guise, was published in Harper's uh, Monthly uh, in the 1950s. And um, some people look at it as an example of Melville being extremely racist. Um, you know, I don't know uh, uh, how Melville really thought about it. Uh, you would have to ask Melville, he's not around to talk to. But most of the scholarship, including um, uh, Karcher, has taken this uh, piece as a piece of, of satire. Um, he sort of adopts the language of the ethnologists by way of trying to expose their thinking and the stupidity of their thinking. Um, but he uses as his central example in this, um, a group that he calls the Guise, he invents them. Melville obviously knew well enough uh, who, who, you know, who all these groups were, the fact that he also invents this group, the Guise, um, you know, sort of speaks to his, um, uh, speaks also to this being a satire, which I, I think that I also believe uh, myself. But he classifies the Portuguese as this kind of not, not white, not black uh, group. Um, and in this, he includes, uh, you know, he includes Cape Verdeans as well as, uh, as other kinds of Portuguese. Um, the ethnologists give way to sociologists in the early 1920s, 1910s, 1920s. And with a huge influx of immigration into the US. Now remember, there's no immigration services. People come to the US because they got recruited to work. They go to work and now they're in the country. There's no um, notion that they, um, that they don't belong or they're not allowed to be here. It's not like they had to apply for visas. Um, as more and more people come, there are, there are gr greater restrictions placed on the boats on which uh, people leave. But remember that most of the work being done collecting data on immigrants and all this and writing down who the immigrants were, were not being done by federal government officials. They were actually being done by the people on the boats that ran the ships. So, um, you know, that were transporting these workers. Um, so as more and more people, uh, more and more immigrant, uh, low level immigrants are needed to, to feed and fuel America's industrial revolution, a uh, second industrial revolution, um, sociologists begin to discuss what they call, refer to as quote unquote, the immigrant problem. The immigrant problem uh, effectively comes down to what are we gonna do with all of these people who are mentally inferior, physically inferior, and shouldn't become citizens because they don't have the wherewithal to understand and master politics. Um, this is in their thinking, obviously, not, um, you know, not in mine. Um, and one of the things that they do is they start to create all of these categorizations and dichotomies of different kinds of migrants. Uh, some of them, they build on old classifications of the ethnologists, the 19th century ethnologists, um, but, um, uh, but they get repurposed uh, to think about and look at this, these newer immigrants that come in in the 1920s, 1910s. And um, the Portuguese also uh, become enveloped in this. Um, most people, if you look at uh, some of the writing like Bushy, Locke, um, uh, you know, the Dillingham Commission reports, especially, which I'm going to talk about in a, in a quick minute. Um, they are all talking about the Portuguese really as a non, uh, non-white uh, category. Um, and this actually gets written into the law in many places in the South, for example, 
Um, later on, in the, later on in the century, uh, the Portuguese are not allowed to go to. Um, uh, uh, they're basically segregated in very weird ways, where um, they're they're not required to go to uh, black schools, but they also are not allowed to go to white schools. So it's basically how are the Portuguese able to make an argument over their identities as being white or black? And these categories start to um, emerge. These two categories start to emerge in the way that the sociologists start to talk about, um, talk about these populations. And these categories then start to show up on the census. Now, as an anthropologist, um, we don't look at race as a scientific category, as a fixed category. All of these um, you know, genetic tests that people love and that they take, um, from my perspective, they're deeply, deeply flawed. And they're deeply flawed because um, they rely on all kinds of assumptions about who the groups are of people are that fit into those, you know, into those categories. Um, if you want to talk about the, the my my ideas or or about some of the criticisms, I think of, of some of those genetic tests, we can uh, we can have another discussion about that. Otherwise, that's going to take a whole hour of our time. Uh, so I'd rather uh, focus on what we're talking about here. But nonetheless, from an anthropologist's point of view, um, these uh, um, uh, racial character, racial identities, and ethnic identities are what we call social constructions. That is. They're agreed upon categories that society has um, based on how people are treated to be put into a particular category or not. And how one is classified is not something that's consistent throughout their entire lives. How one is classified changes over time. And it changes as a result of politics, it changes as a result of history, and it changes as a result of individuals themselves and how they present their own, um, you know, their own uh, racial characteristics. Now, there are limits to this in that however a society is defining racial identities um, will obviously be pushed back on by people who have power. They will or will they will not let people um, transform their racial classification. And sadly, what also happens is many individuals, and this goes back to what we were talking about, about how every subsequent immigrant group that has encounters problems then tries to treat the next group in the same way that they were treated. This is actually part of a process of participation in what are understood as white nationalist, uh, you know, discourses of power. In other words, the newer immigrant group comes in; um, they aren't considered white. And one way to become white in America is by being racist against other groups. That's how one makes an argument for one's white identity. Um, this will become clear if we talk about if we move on to some of these next slides. So the Dillingham Commission reports uh, is a U.S. governmental um, uh, commission. Um, and it includes sociologists, it includes business people, it includes unionists, it includes uh, clergymen, it includes lawyers. There are many, many, many people that get recruited to put together this 41 volume uh, edition. Um, there's a couple of great, I'm gonna put, um, I didn't mention this last time, but um, we have a, a Facebook page for the class. Um, I, I hope that if all of you are on email, if you have Facebook, go to there. Uh, I'm putting up bibliography as we go, but there's going to there's a great book about the Dillingham Commission reports that just came out a couple of years ago um, that you should take a look at if you're interested in learning more about uh, about the Dillingham Commission reports. Otherwise, go to the Wikipedia page. All of the links to the Dillingham Commission reports are up to date because I fixed them all a couple of years ago uh, when I was frustrated that none of them were up and running. Um, so you have great links to online copies of all 41 of the Dillingham Commission reports. Um, the uh, the volumes um, are actually quite um, uh, they're, they're not all consistent in their anti-immigrant uh, um, attitudes, but on balance they're quite anti-immigrant. And it's these Dillingham Commission reports um, looking at quote unquote the immigrant problem that lead to uh, all of the uh, anti-immigrant laws that get passed in the subsequent over the teens and into the twenties. Um, th these were used as the basis. To, um, to, to get the political clout to, in order to pass those, um, or the political momentum in order to pass those laws. Um, how are the Portuguese treated in the Dillingham Commission report? So you can see, if you look at this, is, this is how um, one of the racial definitions of, um, of, the Portug of Portuguese immigrants in uh, Folkmar's, at, um, one of, in one of the taxonomies collected by Folkmar, and there's, there's different ones. The Portuguese aren't always treated this way. Um, and this is actually one interesting thing about the Portuguese. Some of the sociologists treat Portuguese, um, you know, classify Portuguese as as um, as non-white. Some class 
classify them as white. Some classify them as not really white or non-white, um, some mixture of something. Um, and again, these are made up categories, right? They talk about things in terms of blood, but this is how identity works. Identity works as um, you know, we, we come to social definitions over these, over these categories and then decide that we're gonna treat people based on, uh, you know, based on these categories. Uh, but these categories are made up. They're made up by humans. It doesn't mean they're not real. It doesn't mean that people don't confront real problems about them, but they are not scientific natural categories, categories of race. Um, so as you can see here, you know, they have this category, this taxonomy where they include Azores and Cape Verde, people from the Azores and Cape Verdean, um, you know, uh, as uh, Negro immigrants, as they call them, uh, including the West Indies, it classified them with the West Indies. This was in the Dillingham Commission reports. Um, this slide actually should have been earlier. I got messed up when I was talking about unskilled laborers. The fact that uh, many of the unskilled laborers were not, um, you know, were not uh, treated by the, um, you know, were, were not allowed to join. And what added to this was that they were not white. That was one of the arguments that were made, that um, only whites should be allowed to be in the skilled unions. Whites should only be protected in these skilled unions too, because these are skilled jobs. Um, and the language used against the immigrants, uh, that they were amoral, that they were, um, you know, that they were physically and mentally inferior. Um, was both an argument for their not joining the unions and for their not being allowed to become citizens. So how did this affect Falmouth? Um, some of these discourses actually make it into Falmouth quite a bit. And I, again, I wanna give a huge, a huge thank you to the um, Falmouth Enterprise Archive at the Falmouth Public Library, which has facilitated extraordinary, extraordinary academic research by having us online. Um, it's really a, an incredible source of information you really get a sense of what was going on in Falmouth at the time, um, and I would encourage anybody to go back in some of these old, these old enterprise, the old enterprise archive, and just read read a couple of editions from you know from this time period, or do a search if you want uh, uh, on a, a term like Portuguese or Cape Verdean, and um, and just do a deep dive into this incredible, incredible historical resource um, that the Falmouth Public Library has. But um, on the cranberry bogs. Um, you have a couple of, um, of uh, one situation in that um, Frederick Swift is one of the cranberry bog owners with the Swift brothers. That's a very famous, um, the very famous cranberry bog owners in Falmouth. Um, these guys, consistent with the times, did not treat their workers very well, and um, and also uh, uh, spoke in in in, in really um, uh, gross racial characteristics about the uh, racial um, um, uh, What's the word I'm looking for? They they they, they uh, spoke in racially inflammatory uh, terms about um, about the Portuguese Falmouth. There's an incredible exchange of letters that takes place in the early 1900s when uh, when you start to have large numbers of Portuguese coming to Falmouth. And what starts to happen is the Portuguese are more or less okay once they're staying as workers on the cranberry bogs. Once they move off the cranberry bogs and start to uh, buy their own land and start to become their own uh, uh, you know small farmers and and owners. Uh, there starts to be quite a bit of pushback in town um, from some of the other residents. Um, and, you know, this wasn't, I, I want to add this right here because it's actually quite important that there were many Falmouth residents actually that were extremely, extremely um, uh, instrumental in helping the Portuguese to find a toehold, that were instrumental in helping them also to develop their capacities. Um, whether it was developing business, whether it was in agriculture, whether it was in, in other capacities as well as what it was, we'll find out in a second from Lou uh, when he talks about um, you know, some of these populations. But in any case, this exchange of letters essentially um, uh, starts when Fred Swift uh, condemns the Portuguese for being in the, East Falmouth, the newly formed East Falmouth School. Um, and he calls effectively for, segregate, for the Portuguese to be segregated from those schools. Uh, both the Cape Verdeans and the Azorians. And there's a huge back and forth here from uh, a number of the Falmouth residents. Um, some other people talk, like in Harwich, for example, Cape Verdeans were, uh, and this actually appears in the Dillingham Commission uh, reports, that um, Cape Verdeans um, were, were being uh, required to go to segregated schools in, uh, in Harwich. Um, and there was arguments in Falmouth that perhaps the same thing should be done with the Portuguese in Falmouth. Um, it didn't end up happening, uh, but it was part of the discourse uh, by, among some of the, the residents, including both Fred Swift and Winfield S. Baker. Um, the big pushback on this came 
from um, a number of people. One was signed by an anonymous uh, Portuguese. Uh, another one was written by John Emerald. Who was John Emerald? Lou's gonna tell you all about John Emerald in a second. Uh, but John Emerald was one of the very first um, uh, commercial strawberry growers. So the, the enterprise calls him the very first um, 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 commercial strawberry grower in town. This name Emerald obviously doesn't sound very much like a Portuguese name until you realize that Portuguese were changing their names quite a bit. Um, and and uh, along with many other immigrant groups uh, that, that you know would often change their names. Uh, I would encourage you to go to the Migrant Communities Project website. Uh, there's a great panel on uh, name changes among Portuguese uh, that you can take a look at there um, uh, on the Facebook site. Uh, but in any case, uh, he was really, he was born João Amaral from, and he was from uh, São Miguel Açores. João Amaral was, was one of the first, he actually came down from, uh, from outside off Cape uh, and worked as a farmer. He was a farm hand, um, uh, had been working, I believe also uh, as in factories before that. He ends up becoming one of the very first uh, fire watchers in Falmouth. This was a job that many Portuguese had, um, which is interesting because being a fireman is still a job that many Portuguese had throughout the 20th century and even today, including my dad. Uh, who was a fireman for uh, his entire, uh, pretty much his entire life um, in, in the Falmouth Fire Department. Um, so, um, you know, uh, he was one of the very first fire watchers, watchers in Falmouth. And um, this actually transforms into the new Falmouth Fire Department, the beginning of the Falmouth Fire Department as several Portuguese uh, that are already in the fire department from, from almost from the very, very beginning. Uh, John Emerald being, uh, or John João Amaral uh, being, uh, being one of them. He writes a, a really wonderful letter, um, essentially condemning uh, all this racial, the racialization of the Portuguese and the, and the discrimination being levied against the Portuguese by, um, you know, by the, um, uh, by, by the Swift and Baker letters. I'm going to put all this stuff up on our, uh, on our website, uh, if you go there. And then uh, Lou's going to talk about the, Am the Amaral family, but I just wanted to um, end, my, end my remarks here with, um, with a quick little uh, uh, photo here for you to keep, take a look at when we talk about them. The very first uh, transatlantic um, uh, uh, flight across the Atlantic Ocean. Um, people uh, never really know what it was, but it actually took place um, through the Azores from, uh, from New York to Massachusetts, to Nova Scotia, to Newfoundland, to the Azores, to Lisbon, uh, where I am now. So, um, and this took place in 1919. The reason I'm showing this is one, because there's the Azores in the background where the, um, and they did it in stages, they didn't do it all at once. They would be eclipsed by about a month later by the English who take a much shorter route from uh, closer to the, uh, to the pole between uh, uh, way north in Canada and Newfoundland uh, to, uh, to Corkill in, uh, in Ireland, much, much quicker little route uh, than was taken by the US Navy uh, in their Navy Curtis flying boat. Um, but along the route were various uh, destroyers. And you can see here this uh, destroyer uh, or destroyer, this ship um, uh, that sort of lined the lined the path with lights so that the planes wouldn't get lost, um, and also acted in support. And uh, someone from Falmouth, Hiram uh, Emerald, or Hiram Emerald, uh, was uh, was um, uh, one of the people working on this uh, on this uh, on this mission. So this guy, a kid from Falmouth, uh, ends up being uh, someone who, um, uh, or with with his family in Falmouth, uh, ends up being someone who uh, is, uh, works on this. Um, the first transatlantic flight across the ocean. What year is and this? This is this takes place in 19, uh, 1919, May 27, 1919. And this is the plane, the, the, the four of them left, one last one made it. Um, this was in uh, 1919. And this is right in Lisbon, right, uh, right in the Teju River, or, or the Tagus River, as I guess it's called in the US, uh, in, um, in, in Lisbon. Uh, that's it for me. A uh, little background, historical context to what was going on. Lou's going to tell you about uh, Falmouth and some of the families in Falmouth that he researched and Karen also. Lou, take it away. Okay. I cannot, uh, do you have to release the screen, Mike? I can't, I can't pick up the, there we are. Okay, good. Just click on the tab you want to share. I'm clicking on share screen. Yep. And then um, tell it which tab you want to share. Okay. That there, looks great. Good. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to. Uh, okay. 
Okay. Good. Okay. This, uh, I'm not, this just over a little bit, what Michael said, I'm uh, not going to go over some of these numbers, um, other than to say that when he talked about recruiting, um, that's a, that's really more accurate than most people realize because they actually sent people to the Azores uh, to try to attract people to come to work in these factories. Um, and these factories um, were hot and humid in addition to being because they had to be because of the threads. So it's very often that the temperatures are well above 100. They're very big health problems. I'm going to skip some of these slides. Um, other than, so this is the original, last time we talked about the people that were in Falmouth before 1880, it was basically onesies, people that were adopted because they were on ship, et cetera. Um, the, the ones that came between 1880 and 1900 were very, very different. Um, the first uh, that I can find proof of is Antona Augusta. Um, the emeralds are very big starting, and we'll talk about the individual families. Um, and there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight of these people. One of them um, is Alexander Barrows, who is the first Cape Verdean uh, that I can find um, indications were here. The Augusta family <coughs> were strawberry farmers, early strawberry farmers, um, but you know, he didn't come straight to Falmouth. He immigrated in Portsmouth, later came to Falmouth, and originally he worked in cranberry bogs. And then for many years, he worked at uh, Barzilai Cahoon's dairy farm uh, on Oxbow Road. Um, it wasn't until sometime in the 1890s that he began getting into strawberries. And by the end of that decade, he had 22 acres. Um, the Augusta family is huge. Uh, uh, the first strawberry festival queen in Falmouth was Cynthia Botello, uh, his granddaughter. Um, Anton himself was president of the Cape Cod Strawberry Growers Association many years. Uh, the Falmouth Lumber Company is owned and operated by his son, John. Um, originally he came in at Providence um, he didn't have enough money because where he ended up like, actually immigrating was Portsmouth, New Hampshire. He didn't have enough money to get from Portsmouth to Falmouth. He could have from, from Providence. So what he did is that he had to, he got as far as Wareham where he worked at this nail company until he could get enough money to complete his trip to Falmouth. Um, but again, very successful. The Emerald family, there are three brothers. Um, the, the first one that, that Mike Miguel talked about was John. Um, he was born 1864. He was here in 1876. In 1990, he marries Augusta Johnson, and that's when he becomes a strawberry farmer. Um, and he does that for a number of years. The rest of the family immigrates. Uh, this is John and his wife, uh, Augusta, um, and this is Manuel. Um, the em and the Emerald House that you see on Davisville Road now is, is his. This is his brother, Frank. Um, when Manuel married, we talked before how in that first wave of people that came over, none of them married anybody from the Azores. But here, when... Manuel gets married, he sends back for his bride, and they get married in Woods Hole. Shortly after that, he purchases this Davisville Road property. His brother John actually left Falmouth and moved to Brockton and opened a greenhouse where he dies in 1916. Um, one of the unusual things about Manuel is that he remained an independent strawberry farmer. Uh, there were a number of these. Uh, he was one. Um, uh, we'll come across a couple of others. Most of the strawberry farmers joined one of the two strawberry associations, but he didn't. Uh, he trucked 
he trucked his own strawberries into Boston and sold them there. Um, I'm going to go through these quickly because we're running really short on time. This is another, uh, this happens to be my great, great aunt. Um, she married Manuel Vieira Martins. They are both from Pico. Again, this is another case of a whaler coming to this country, emigrating first to New Bedford, eventually moves to, to Walk White, where he becomes a, sm a small scale independent strawberry farmer. His son, Joseph, inherits the business, uh, inherits the farm rather, and continues, but they were not large scale as were the Augustas, or certainly not the Emeralds. Um, he's interred in the old Catholic cemetery on Gifford Street. Um, another unknown to most people, Fernando Joseph, um, also from Peak, uh, came to Boston, marries a woman from Fayal, but he didn't know her uh, before this, and they get married in Dighton. He moves to Quisset, as again, this is where the Driggs were, this is where uh, Toby was, um, who became William Ford. But unlike some of these others, Joseph is a bit of an entrepreneur, and he hires people uh, to help him catch fish and lobsters, um, which he, he then proceeds to bring to the market himself. Um, he's one of the largest early landowners in that he purchased the Walker Block. Uh, this was built, I think, in the late 1880s. It's across the street from the library. Um, and he opened the, the Falmouth restaurant. Um, and his family is still here today. Alexander Barrows, uh, another example, the first one from, from uh, Cape Verde that I know of. Um, and the, he's a bit of a mystery man, and maybe Karen can shed some light on this, because we know that he spent, he made many trips between uh, the Cape and Cape Verde, um, prolific, 18 children. Um, and in Falmouth, he was a farmer. He also was a laborer. Um, there are many, many land, transactions involving him, and the first of which is with Lizzie Coleman. Um, he also had farms, and he died in the early 1920s. And Karen, do you have anything you want to add about Alexander Barrows? Well, like you said, he was a... Karen? We can't hear you. Uh, it's, it's more out there than, uh-oh, can you okay. hear me? Yes, we can now. Okay, <clears throat> so he, he did a lot of that. Um, and from what I, I've only just started. Lou and Miguel have been doing this for years. I've only been doing this for like a year. Um, but with Alexander, I believe he fights to become a to vote at in the early 1900s. He's a landowner and he fights for that. And he does so many things. But I think going back and forth to Cape Verde, he might have been involved in the packer industry, get, transporting people and um, supplies back and forth to Cape Verde because there was no steamship route. You, we had to make our own. Because okay. I, I can't understand where he's making all his money. <laughs> okay. Well, like I said, he's he's a bit of a mystery man. But this is a, this is a, something that came up with that history group that M Miguel was talking about uh, earlier that we started that to, and in uh, the Cape Verdean uh, Museum uh, currently at, at the Emerald House. Um, so we need to do more work in finding out about this person. By the 1900s, this is the, now this is according to the 1900 United States Census. There's a lot, it's exploded from that small number that you saw before um, to this huge number of, of families, most of them from the Azores. Um, 
Fayal, the Western Islands is another name for the Azores, et cetera. Um, only one that we know of at that time um, from Cape Verde. The, uh, Miguel talked earlier about the populations of, you know, the, and, and, and the mills of New Bedford and Fall River. Uh, this is a graph that shows the population of New Bedford, the population of Fall River, um, compared to, and this scale for Portuguese immigration is obviously it's scaled down just so we can see a comparable trend, but this is divided by thousands. Um, and this line here is the Portuguese in Falmouth. And again, to show trends, I've multiplied those numbers by a thousand. And, but what it, and the whole point behind this is to show there's about a generation lag between immigration uh, into, whoops, immigration to the mills and people and the rapid increase in population in Falmouth. And I believe that it's because the people were there working under onerous conditions um, in the mills, getting sick uh, and able to save enough money that they can make their way and hopefully buy a little bit in Falmouth. Not only some didn't do that, some began while well, they're still working in the mills, working seasonally in Falmouth and they couldn't get work in the mills, um, later moving here. A lot of them lived in Calico Town. I'm gonna skip this other than to say that, you know, these are people that are living very frugally, clearing land by hand, building homes with old wood or new wood from their own trees. They all farmed as one of two jobs. They had to be laborers because farms, farming was basically subsistence farming for most. Um, they ate according to what food was available. Nobody, uh, you, you tend to eat chicken in the springtime and, and beef and pork in the fall. Um, and they're all self-sufficient and learning to become group sufficient. Manuel Roderick is a perfect example of that. I mean, he was in Cape Verde. He, he was on a whaler. In two and a half years, he earned a total of $178. Um, comes to New Bedford, works, marries a mill worker also from Cape Verde, works on schooners for a while. And 1898, he starts picking strawberries for one season in Falmouth because he couldn't get work in the mills. He returns to pick strawberries to pick cranberries eventually becomes a supervisor and then a landowner. Um, years later, his grandson Polino becomes the police chief. It's another example of a Cape Verde. And this is another, uh, this is uh, Karen's uncle. Um, he came from a family of uh, a shipping family in Cape Verde. Um, he captained many schooners, he became a strawberry farmer. Um, Karen will. Why don't I turn this over to you? You want to talk about your uncle and your own experiences with the family and their properties? Um, oh, well, where do I start? <clears throat> well, um, there's a time when he, when he first immigrates to the United States in, I don't know, 18, um, it's like 1890 or something like that. Um, I don't know if he, he's another schooner that's doing, tra bringing Cape Verdeans over to the United States. And that little oval picture on the bottom, which I haven't identified them, they're all schooners, schooner captains doing the same thing because the um, Cape Verde had had so many droughts and so much poverty that that was almost their only lifeline. A whole town, 2,500 people starved to death. And the only way to get there was with these um, old whaling ships that they purchased or schooners. And they started, and I, that's another one. I think he gets, that's where he gets his money because he's another one who has, I remember acres and acres. He had over a hundred in my lifetime and it wasn't him. It was his wife because he had already died and they had already sold off so much. 
Um, but he was, um, one of the stories that I read that I liked was the Strawberry Growers Association. They had something like um, 2,000 new seedlings, strawberry seedlings, that they were going to try out on the Cape. They gave 500 to Mr. Martin. They gave 500 to Uncle Louie. That's what I call him, Uncle Louie. They lived across the street from each other, and they were prolific farmers. Um, and all and 26 other strawberry growers were given the other 1,000. So they had to have been pretty doggone good. And that's like, I, I, I haven't had time to look up at all, but between Louis Santos and his wife, who takes over after him, they are prolific in the strawberry um, growing. Um, in fact, Grandma Santos gets awarded Strawberry Growers Association Awards, I, and I haven't even started on her. But getting back to Louie, he, um, he was always in the field People um, would come from, he had so much land that people would come from Howard's, Fall River, Providence, just for the season to pick because he was tough, but he paid good. Um, and he never went to church. The rest of the family did. Now, this has been passed down from the families, and I remember hearing these stories my whole life that when the St. Anthony's Church was built, they took a loan, the, the strawberry growers took out a loan for the land. And then the Portuguese community, that's Azorian, Cape Verde, all of them, they worked as a group. They built that church. And I believe the church told them, you build it, we'll send you a priest. And Luis Santos supposedly paid for all the wood, but he never went inside the church. <laughs> um, but that, and he was, he was an original member of the Holy Ghost Society. Um, he had, and, and there's so much going on. I'm, I'm not prepared for this, <laughs> but he was, he was another, along with Mr. Barrows, Mr. Santos, the two of them had, multiple acres of land that I, and a lot of it in Mashby that I haven't even started to look up. And they were, they were characters. Uh, Louis Santos, there was a cow, a rogue cow, and there was a reward for it. Well, him and one of his friend, who I forgot to look up the name, went out and they said, we know where that cow is. And they found him. They shot him, they butchered him, took him home, and then went and tried to collect the reward for the cow after they had already divvied up all the meat. <laughs> so they were quite, <laughs> quite something. Right. And they also gave stakes to the chief of police. I remember seeing that in the story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they were, they were characters. <laughs> but like you said, because of the racism that was going on, and they were of a, a darker color, they stuck out. So they had to kind of wiggle their way and still make a decent life. And apparently they both, both Santos and Barrows, they had a whole lot of land. <laughs> the, but there's still a... Uh, if, if you go up Route 28 in Walk White, on the left, you'll see Barrows Road, uh, which is where Alexander Barrows had his land. Uh, right. I also, in looking through some of the land transactions, um, his Mashpee property was purchased by the New Seabury, New Seabury Association. Um, so right. Yeah, quite a bit of land. They, and, and, and Louis Santos, he had already died, and his wife... I guess I, something about, he said, don't sell any more land. So she never sold any land after he died. And New Seabury wanted to have a bridal path. 
she yanked their chain for, I don't know, 20 years before she finally said, okay, you can have that little strip of land so you can have your little horse track. She, she, and she loved it. She'd sit there and grin and go, nope, not this year. And she was, she was something else. And I, and I want to get going on her because I want people to be aware of Louis's wife. And I think she should get acknowledgement for what she went through as a female. She should be one of the noted females on Cape Cod, if not just Falmouth. Absolutely. You know, and this is, this is, uh, again, going back to uh, Alexander Barrows and, and Luis Santos, these are things that really came to light, at least for me, mainly during uh, that history group that Miguel formed. Um, although I did know of Luis Santos because of the Holy Ghost. And, uh, he, and, and your I, family owned property in the room. That's right. That's right. Okay, we're kind of running out of time. I'd like to do one more because uh, this is another example um, of that migration. This is uh, Chambinia Barbosa uh, from, she's born in St. Michael. Her parents emigrate when she's four, leaving her behind. She lives with her grandmother. Um, her father goes back to get her four years later. Um, they emigrated. Ellis Island, and they go back and they live in Walcott Street in New Bedford. The next year, at the age of nine, she goes to work in the mills. Um, very common. Everybody in the family worked. Uh, all the money that they made went into the family coffers. She didn't get to keep any of the money that she made. At that time, she changed her name uh, to Alice. Um, because the family knew that if she went into the mills with the name Chambina, uh, she'd get harassed even more than she did. Um, a decade later, the family is, has a uh, house on, on Clark Street in Falmouth. Um, Joseph Pont, uh, also from uh, St. Michael, is a boarder there, and she ends up by marrying... Now, Joseph, when he first came, he was... He was a laborer. He shoveled coal in the New Bedford Mills, you know, to, to fill it uh, for the boilers. Um, and Falmouth, he worked mostly as a laborer, although he also ended up by saving enough money to buy strawberry fields later. Um, this is uh, Alice P. Dutra. Um, he dies in 1942. His three sons are all off to World War II. He knew he would never be seeing them again. Um, so she was left, uh, you know, to continue raising the family in the 50s. Uh, she sold off the strawberry fields that uh, they had purchased to a Manese family, incidentally. I, I don't know which one. I'll have to look that up. Um, and until the six, you know, in the 60s, she was providing daycare for her granddaughter. And again, she died in 1976. Uh, this is my grandmother, my mother, and my godfather, uh, Uncle Mike. Um, Again, this is all taken at about the time of uh, just before he left for war, uh, while Joseph was still alive. Um, but this is another case of Chimbina becomes Alice Barboza, and I missed her. Whoops. Uh, I was I think it was Nancy that asked about genealogy and tracing. Um, when I was trying to trace her roots, I missed her family being in Falmouth in 1910. Uh, because they were not listed as Barboza, they were listed as Barbos. Um, so the search engine I was using didn't find it. Uh, the census data that I had when I did my sorting uh, to, to do a search, I didn't find her then either um, because their race was listed as Black. Um, so a lot of things, and this gets back to Miguel's comment about how do people get classified and, and counted. Um, this is a, a perfect example of um, their Azorian. They were class some Azorians are classified as blacks. Some are classified as whites. It all depends on um, who the person uh, taking the data is. Um, so again, Chambinia Barboza becomes Alice Barboza. Joseph Pont becomes Joseph Dutra. 
Uh, she marries, becomes Alice Dutra. So there's a lot of different names and a lot of confusion when you try to taste genealogy roots. And I think we are about out of time. Michael, do, 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 Miguel, do you want to stop here or and continue next week, or should we keep going? Yeah, this is this is a good spot, I think, to to, to stop because um, we kind of we're we're kind of brought up to twenty one twenty four when the um, when when the the new legislation gets passed when um, uh, that effectively ends the migration of Portuguese and other immigrant groups. Effectively, uh, quotas get set that that. Um, it's a whole quote of the uh, formula, that get, the mathematical formula that says a certain percentage of, of immigrants um, uh, are only allowed into the country based on the number of immigrants that were in the country. And they set a date way before any of the Southern Europeans uh, had come to the United States. So it was a very, very, very small quota that effectively ended, um, although didn't entirely end, migration from uh, Cape Verde and the Azores and continental Portugal, Madeira coming into the US. So we'll pick up next uh, week. Next week, we're gonna talk about some of the institutions that these groups of, of immigrants founded. Um, uh, Karen and Lou mentioned one, which was a Holy Ghost Society. Uh, we'll also uh, talk about, um, you know, talk about some of these others. And- um, We had uh, one that, question. That were, oh, yeah. sorry. I think we had one question you didn't get to. What is Calico 10? Oh yeah, that was Cal Calico 10. I was gonna ask uh, Lou, Lou, um, we have a question here from someone who says, what is Calico Town? Calico Town was a name that was given um, to, it's actually part of what is currently Carriage Shop Road. Um, it was the area between uh, this, where Hayway Road meets uh, Carriage Shop Road, which is right where the Holy Ghost Society is, um, which on some Google Maps is shown as Smallville. Um, but from that intersection to the end of Carriage Shop Road, um, where it meets, uh, oh gosh, Old Bonstable Road. Um, that area was called Calico Town. It was a, uh, uh, a, a term used with derision, obviously, by uh, some of the Falmouth residents, um, because the women there all tended to wear very colorful cloth made from the factories in New Bedford, as opposed to the rather staid, conservative, black clothing, uh, not colorful clothing of most of the people in Falmouth at the time. So because of the colorful, the colorful clothing and the calico cloth, they called it Calico Town. Uh, they were able to get this calico cloth because it was left over from bolts at the factories. Um, so they would take all these leftover pieces and use them to make their own clothing. Hence the term yeah, Calico Town. I, I wonder also if there's uh, something to uh, the notion of calico being uh, mixed and colorful that's also built into that as well. That's a pure uh, yes. speculation, pure, pure speculation, and, and a question I would ask you. But uh, wow. good possibility. Yeah, I also want to make a correction. I think I said earlier that it was uh, Philip Rabisa that sold the land. Philip is actually the grandson of Louis Rabisa, and Philip was someone who I interviewed this summer as part of our history pr group project. I did an, uh, um, a pretty nice and extensive oral history of, of him talking about his family. And I just wanted to thank Ginger Rabisa for bringing that to my attention, um, uh, just to set the, rec the record straight uh, for you all there. He, so, he also, um, Miguel, uh, we should point out that he also owns one of the few remaining picker sheds in Falmouth, um, you know, where the, where the strawberry pickers and, yeah. you know, all these farmers that came in that would go to get these workers from Onset and, and other places in Wareham and Fairhaven, uh, they came here for the six weeks of strawberry picking season. And rather than travel back and forth every day, a lot of the strawberry farmers built these picker sheds that would house anywhere from 10 to 25 workers. I know that my, my great grandfather had uh, about eight or 10 in his picker shed. Manuel Emerald, I believe had 25. He had about 22 acres. Um, so again, there were these temporary housing all over town. Um, for migrant workers, essentially. Yeah, Lou, th thank Lou, Lou and I are actually trying to work on uh, writing an uh, researching and writing an article about these picker sheds in Falmouth. Um, most of them were destroyed. Uh, there's not a lot of records on them, as Lou found out. Um, uh, until the uh, the building permit, it's required to have building permits. There's not really a lot of information about them. Um, Ed's here. Uh, we we uh, I actually found out about that picker shed from Philip himself. 
who um, um, you can see some of them uh, here and there in town. A lot of times they're turned into garages. Uh, in the case of um, in, on Phillips property, which used to be Louis Rabisa's farm, um, uh, there's a garage that was used as a, as a picker shed. And then also um, basically what was a picker shed ends up getting built into the house as an extension on the house uh, when he, and he sort of just creates a new, a new extension on his house with his picker shed. So they're, they're kind of difficult to find out where they are, but um, it's really an important piece of Falmouth history and a memorialization that uh, we don't really think about was, you know, these workers that really built the town and, um, you know, in that, uh, and that worked sometimes, you know, on, uh, oftentimes under very difficult conditions uh, where in doing was so. Where picker shed? So the picker shed is on, um, it's on Sandwich Road. Um, uh, it's, it's on the Rabisa farm site on, uh, on Sandwich Road, the beginning of Sandwich Road. Um, Has it been modified? Time. Well, yeah, I mean, it got turned, he basically built a, built a, what do they call it? An extension, I'm, I'm not sure, an add-on mm -hmm. on the house. Oh, okay. Yeah. And, because um, across the street from Robert Roderick's house are yeah. two picker sheds that would turn into one room of uh, housing. But if you look, uh, that there, I've yeah, they're, they're, there's two more. But I didn't know if yeah, you not, knew about I'm, them. I'm not sure. I'm not sure where those are, Karen. I know that um, Larry Balbuena, who's uh, works in construction and is um, is in the Cape Verdean Club of Falmouth, um, he sent me some pictures of two of two that got turned into homes as what well. they got expanded and turned into homes, as well. And the pictures that he sent me are brilliant. They're um, he, he um, they hadn't been changed since they were built. And when they stripped the walls down, it was all the original of um, mm. uh, what are they called Fra framing on the house from, mm -hmm. from when they were originally built, and then they built over it. So, Ed, these are these are some that uh, you need to look into. Uh, <laughs> uh, anyway, th th thank you all. I think we're a little over time. Yes. Um, yeah, I, I I don't have a problem uh, spending another ten minutes if people want to uh, ask questions. But um, I think we should finish talking. If people have questions, I don't know Sue if you need to turn off the Zoom. No, uh, I don't. I don't. Works. I no. I don't need to. Um, so if anyone so, has so, any, so if there's questions any questions that weren't uh, covered, uh, if not, uh, we'll see you next time. Uh, oh, yeah. Please go a to question. our website. Oh, one oh, question. Yeah. I, um, the Portuguese immigrants. When did they become citizens? Were these people that you're talking about? Were any of them citizens early on? Yeah, well, I mean, you know, most become citizens almost immediately because the, the, the rules were not the way they are now. Like, basically, if you came to the U.S., you became a citizen. If you, if you were allowed to come into the to, into the U.S., you would, you you know, there was a process through which you would become a citizen. Um, next well, week, wasn't it early on you had to own property? You had to be a male and you had to own property. Yeah, I mean, there's and there's other considerations also, like there's literacy requirements that that um, mm -hmm. all, that also are part of this um, at certain points. Um, and then there's other considerations as well, which actually next next week we're going to talk about this at great length uh, when we talk about the Americanization movement or the movement to quote the quote unquote movement to Americanize the immigrant and um, how some of the immigrants in Falmouth responded uh, to this large movement, how they participated in it um, and how they worked on it. Yeah, um, there's a, I think Roberta Sheffer is raising like literally raising her hand. Um, I want to a little bit more if you know about Tony Andrews farm because I don't live too far from there uh, okay uh, yeah. uh, Karen, he I doesn't get, get here till 1920 oh okay but he's another very interesting character um, <laughs> who, yes and his brother yeah and and, and Tony um, he had to work his way across he did not have passage um, and so he he was basically a deckhand uh, on the passage, and and, and uh, Tony always walked with a limp um, as a result of that because there was a storm um, during which they had trouble getting one of the sails down. They sent him up to uh, to to take it down, and he he shimmies up and he climbs up, and he does get the sail down. Um, but in the heavy rain, as the ship is tossing back and forth. Um, he falls and breaks his leg, um, which is why for the rest of his life, he always had a limp. Uh, Tony was another one of these very successful strawberry farmers. Um, he had the foresight in the 1950s, um, you know, after World War II, there's a great shortage of strawberry pickers. And um, he decided to allow people to pick their own strawberries, which was innovative at the time. 
And he was able to continue as a successful strawberry farmer um, because of that. Other strawberry farmers, like my grandfather, um, did not refuse to have other people walking on his strawberry plants. <laughs> and so he simply cut it back from, uh, uh, at that time, many acres, probably a quarter of an acre, and he sold other products. Um, but Tony was very successful. And he, another uh, amazing person and, and quite a character. Thank you. Wow. And there was just one comment from Ginger. Let me scroll up. She said her maternal grandfather, Frank Costa, applied for citizenship in 1946 and became a citizen shortly after. So, yeah, I mean, this is, um, this is we're, we're going to talk a little bit about next time about this transition from this early 20s period to post-World War II. What World War II meant to the immigrants also, many of, many of whom fought for the, uh, for the United States. Um, and, and how that actually, um, the, the effect that this had, not only on their own understanding of their place in America, uh, but also what happened with the installation of Otis uh, in, uh, on the Cape, and how that uh, also worked in some surprising ways, I think, um, in, in transforming the Portuguese communities uh, in the post-World War II period, uh, with some of the ideas brought from elsewhere in the country to, uh, to, the, to the area. Uh, that were quite different from the way that people here were seeing, uh, were, were thinking about things, uh, or maybe just amplified some of the some of the ways that people here were thinking here. But when I say here, I mean Cape Cod, uh, were thinking about things. Wow. Uh, so, um, uh, looking forward to seeing you all next week. Yes. Uh, thank you all for thank you all for coming. Um, if, if there's any, I don't know if there's any other questions, but if not, um, yeah, uh, just... thanks a lot, and we'll see you. We'll see you soon. Yes. Thanks. Thank you very much for everyone, and have a great week. I'll be in touch. Yeah, sure.